uh, I'm just going to set the table for the, for the speakers who will, uh, will follow. Uh, so starting with federal laws, again, this is just a quick tour. Um, we've got uh, the first major environmental law of the modern era, the National Environmental Policy Act of, uh, created by Congress in 1969. It just establishes a disclosure requirement for federal projects, meaning federally funded projects, federally permitted projects, or projects like building of highway systems that the federal government takes on itself to examine the environment, potential environmental impacts of, uh, uh, of those proposed projects, those proposed federal uh, projects. And it's a purely a disclosure statute. It doesn't have any real regulatory effect per se, but it does involve balancing. And one of the, the, mo the most recent case that it, one of the most recent cases that involved the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA as it's known, because environmental law, everything is an acronym, and I apologize for that in advance, is this case, Winter versus Natural Resources Defense Council, w in which the Supreme Court was really asked uh, to, uh, to resolve a dispute between the United States Navy and environmental organizations led by the Natural Resources Defense Council over uh, sonar testing, uh, which is a key military defense program priority of the U.S. Navy uh, to provide uh, sonar testing and sonar technology by which enemy submarines can be detected uh, for military defense. And that's, I think, from the military side, everybody understands in the 21st century that's really important, uh, vital to our national defense, but there's a problem because many marine biologists will tell you that the, that sonar activity is very disruptive to, disorienting to, and harmful to a variety of marine mammals, including whales. So it was a result of lack of accommodation between the military, the Navy, and environmental interests that this case wound up in the Supreme Court. Uh, and the U.S. Supreme Court, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the current makeup and politics of the Supreme Court, uh, ruled, I believe, unanimously or nearly unanimously in favor of the Navy that uh, the Navy's interests uh, trumped those of, uh, and national security interests rather, trumped those of the environment and uh, uh, marine mammals. Uh, a more explicit balancing of, of environmental and non-environmental concerns occurs all the time under another, uh, the next major uh, envir national environmental law that was enacted by Congress in 1970, the National uh, Clean Air Act to address our uh, oftentimes heavily polluted uh, uh, air basins around the country and to preserve those clean areas uh, that do exist. And uh, the act contains a number of provisions to, that attempts to reconcile those objectives of clean air to protect public health and the environment on the one hand, while not unduly disrupting uh, economic interests. And th this issue about 13 years ago went to the United States Supreme Court, in this case Whitman versus American Trucking Association, in which the trucking industry challenged US EPA's uh, establishment of what are known as national ambient air quality standards, to determining a maximum amount of pollutants, various types of pollutants like carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, particulate matter, uh, the maximum amount that could be established in various air basins around the country, including LA, which is where this picture is taken, uh, sufficient to preserve and maintain public health primarily. Uh, the trucking industry challenged those standards that were set by the United States Environmental Protection Agency on the ground that they didn't adequately take into account economic interests, business interests, that these standards, these air pollution standards, would have a, a deleterious, prejudicial effect on the economy of the country, and particularly the trucking industry. And in this case, the United States Supreme Court, I think, again unanimously held that when it comes to establishing these national standards of air quality, to which we all want to aspire, and that Air, air quality regulators are required to, to regulate, that economic interests, those business interests of the trucking industry or any economic interests are functionally irrelevant to the inquiry and the establishment of these air pollution standards. That when it comes to the establishment of these air quality standards across the nation, uh, it, is, it is protection of public health and safety, which is an overriding and exclusive criterion that ought to be applied. So the question might you might ask yourself as well, are economics and economic business interests irrelevant when it comes to the Clean Air Act? And the answer is, it is not, because about uh, three years later, another case uh, went to the Supreme Court, uh, and this involved a proposed uh, expansion of a major mine in Alaska uh, in a very rural, remote area north of the uh, Arctic Circle known as the Red Dog Mine that wanted to expand and in the process was going to use a lot of fossil fuel generators that were going to uh, generate a lot more air pollution in this uh, otherwise pristine area. Uh, 
And the issue was, uh, uh, what are, what's the standard to be applied? And Congress and the Clean Air Act say that when you have a new or expanded industrial facility, like the one shown here, um, uh, companies have to use what's known as best available control technology. And the question then becomes, and the question before the court was, well, what's the best available control technology? And the court said very clearly in this case, that's where economics is important because uh, best available control technology, available implicitly assumes that economics, uh, available technology, and the cost of that uh, air pollution mitigation uh, technology is, in fact, uh, relevant. Uh, I could talk about the Clean Water Act, but I'm going to blow past that one. It's a hugely important statute, and you're going to hear more about it because one of our guest speakers is going to uh, speak directly to that. Uh, an example of a federal law, uh, probably the one that many of you are most familiar with so far, and I'm guessing most of, more of you will bump into the Endangered Species Act than any of the other statutes I'm talking about, uh, the Endangered Species Act, enacted by Congress in 1973, which does a number of things, but primarily is known for uh, the uh, designation, the listing of those plant and animal species that are uh, threatened uh, or, or in danger of imminent extinction. Uh, and uh, once these uh, spe plant or animal species are listed, uh, they are uh, the federal regulators and private parties are required to do certain things or refrain from certain things in order to not uh, to prejudice those, uh, those creatures. The most famous case ever under the Endangered Species Act was decided by the United States Supreme Court way back in 1978, the first time uh, the Endangered Species Act ever made its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And much to the surprise of many people, including most of the members of Congress who voted for this law almost unanimously five years earlier, uh, the court said that we don't do a lot of balancing under the Endangered Species Act because Congress has said the preservation of threatened and endangered species is the highest priority. So in this case, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority wanted to build this teleco dam uh, in the state of Tennessee, and, it, and the, this little critter known as the snail darter uh, was discovered in the waterway, uh, and at the time that was thought that was the only environment anywhere where the snail darter had been found, and it, scientists believe, biologists, that uh, the building of the, and operation of the dam would spell the demise and extinction of the snail darter. And the Supreme Court said, well, in those circumstances, the dam can't be built. The snail darter wins and the environment wins. Now, that's not really the end of the story because Congress then came back and uh, passed a law that allowed the Teleco Dam to be built. And I guess the other bit of good news is that the snail darter was eventually found uh, somewhere else in another uh, waterway other than the one involved. Uh, since then, the Congress adopted some measures to ameliorate the uh, species uber alles approach to the uh, to Endangered Species Act and to provide a little more flexibility, uh, things known as the Habitat Conservation Squad uh, plans and the so-called God Squad, a, a group of, of cabinet officials in a presidential administration that can theoretically come together and veto uh, a listing of a species or regulatory action to protect a species if that's, there's considered to be an overarching, overriding uh, military need. What about the state of California? Uh, same thing, you've got different laws that to varying degrees uh, uh, either accommodate economic and environmental interests or not, as the case may be. Um, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is our little NEPA statute, or our environmental disclosure statute, uh, except it's, it's, a, it's a more robust statute. It has actually substantive effect. It requires, among other things, that when there are feasible mitigation measures to a proposed project, whether it's building uh, a freeway or a new university campus or whatever it may be. Uh, you have to undertake those available mitigation measures as long as they are feasible. And the term feasible is actually defined in the statute uh, uh, as, uh, and, uh, and under, the st under CEQA, uh, feasible means uh, uh, an alternative or a mitigation measure that is, quote, capable of being accomplished in a successful manner within a reasonable period of time, taking into account economic, environmental, social, and technological factors. So that's an example where the California legislature in this instance is expressly incorporating requiring decision makers, regulators like what our first guest speaker, to balance and accommodate economic and environmental uh, interest. What about the Coastal Act? And, and, and this is an environmental law uh, adopted initially by California voters back in 1972 and eventually made permanent in, by the California legislature in 1976. And this involves, among other things, a new state agency that oversees uh, development and preservation and permitting of structures and projects 
up and down California's 1,100 mile uh, coastline. Uh, and it's interesting because, uh, uh, and, and the goals of the Coastal Act are generally well known to promote public access and preservation of finite uh, uh, coastal resources. But the Coastal Act, very, the most powerful coastal protection statute anywhere, not just in this country, but on the planet, it's really unique to California, the strength of its program, uh, runs up against another part of the law, and this is actually the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, the so-called Takings Shaw Clause, which prevents government at the federal, state, or local level uh, from taking private property without paying the property owner just compensation. And I can tell you, because when I was back before I became a full-time academic, I represented the Coastal Commission in court on behalf of the California Attorney General's Office, and this clash between private property rights protected or claimed to be protected under the Takings Clause of the Fifth Amendment, and the police power and the state of California and the Coastal Commission's power to preserve the coast uh, clash all the time. And ultimately, the California legislature explicitly recognized this conflict, this tension, uh, by including a finding that the Coastal Act shall not be construed as authorizing the Coastal Commission to exercise its power to grant or deny a coastal permit in a manner which will take or damage private property for public use without payment of just compensation. So there's an explicit recognition in the Coastal Act that the Coastal Commission's powers are not unlimited, uh, that they are constrained and balanced and offset, if you will, uh, by the uh, private property rights protected uh, by the United States Constitution. And the last statute I was mentioned is the most recent one, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about it, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, also known as AB 32. It's an uh, effort by which the, uh, the California legislature basically told the California Air Resources Board uh, to do whatever is necessary to roll back the level of California's aggregate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, to 1990 levels by the year 2020. And the uh, uh, State Water, the Air Resources Board is currently uh, pursuing any number of regulatory strategies to accomplish that end. One of the uh, most recently adopted and most controversial is the so-called cap and trade program, which uh, is a means by which uh, uh, the, the Air Resources Board and the legislature attempt to introduce some marketplace uh, 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 principles into an otherwise uh, prescriptive system of greenhouse gas regulation uh, by setting uh, a cap on the number of the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that can be emitted in the state, then uh, allocating uh, uh, certain uh, amounts, certain emission levels, amounts of emissions to different industries and businesses around the state, and then basically saying that those business entities, let's take electric utilities, for example, that use, run elect, uh, power plants to generate electricity for 38 million Californians, um, that uh, within the electric utility industry, if there's some uh, uh, generating facilities like, uh, and companies like PG&E that can do this very effectively and can uh, adopt the technology to reduce their emissions uh, uh, below the cap that's established for their company, they are free to, to take those uh, unused uh, allocation emission credits and sell them to another company, say Sa San Diego Gas and Electric, uh, that's having more trouble uh, and uh, reducing its greenhouse gas emissions below that cap. So there's a market for pollution credits. Uh, again, it's very and this is I'm giving a very superficial and quick explanation of the system. Very controversial, but it's an attempt, and it's really an experiment because here in the United States, this kind of market-based system has never been uh, run at, at a degree of complexity and breadth of coverage of the California business sector as is contemplated under AB 32. We're just starting out this program, and we will see. But this is uh, 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 with a, a bow to the Cha California Chamber of Commerce and business interests and a number of uh, members of the legislature who thought, uh, we've got to get away from the so-called command and control approach to environmental regulation and make, uh, make these systems a little more flexible, a little more business friendly, and allow uh, set targets and give uh, regulated, the regulated community a lot more flexibility in figuring out how they're going to come into compliance with environmental laws, in this case, uh, the stringent greenhouse gas reduction levels mandated by AB 32. So that, that's, that's an overview. It's, it's very cryptic. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's also uh, a, a survey of some, but not all, of the environmental laws that I'm guessing a number of you, regardless of what you're pursuing your degrees in, uh, will be coming into contact with. So with that introduction, let me turn it over 
to, uh, uh, well, I'll introduce both of our guest speakers, and, uh, and they're going to speak one at a time. First, to my immediate right, uh, is Michael Laufer. Uh, Michael is the chief counsel of the California State Water Resources Control Board, and he's served in that position since uh, 2005, and in that capacity, he also oversees the legal work for California's nine regional water quality control boards as well. He's been an attorney on the board since uh, 1998. Uh, between 2001 and 2005, he was lead counsel for one of those regional boards, the, the most important and biggest, the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. Before joining the State Water Resource Control Board, uh, Michael was an attorney in private practice. He received his undergraduate degree from Grinnell College and uh, his law degree and a Master of Studies in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School, which is one of, I believe, three specialized law school uh, schools in the country that specialize in environmental law, and I think of the three, Vermont Law School is the best. Uh, and in his capacity as chief counsel, uh, uh, Michael oversees some 40 attorneys. It's a 40-member law firm. And what's unique about the Water Board here in California relative to uh, to, to water regulatory boards in the other 49 states. I, to the best of my knowledge, it's the only one that has authority not o only over water quality, that is pollution control law, it also administers California's system of water rights. And you heard a little bit about that from Tim Quinn and our other speaker last week. Uh, the water rights system in California is being sorely tested now as a result of the drought that we're all enduring. Uh, so Michael will speak first, and after he is done, we're going to hear from one of my colleagues in academia, uh, Brian Gray, but calling uh, Brian a, a professor, which is accurate, is also uh, uh, not really accurate because he is, he is quite the Renaissance man. He's a professor of law at the University of California Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco, where he teaches courses on environmental law, water resources, uh, and a variety of other uh, topics. Uh, he, uh, one of his most recent publications, he was a key speaker at a conference on the public trust doctrine that uh, I hosted and we convened at the law school here at Davis a couple of years ago and he published a law review article entitled Ensuring the Public Trust uh, in 2012. Uh, he also is a lawyer uh, on behalf of the environment. He's argued a variety of environmental and water resources cases before such tribunals as the California Supreme Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit on issues like the National Well and Scenic Rivers Act, uh, the constitutionality of the Reclamation Reform Act of 1982, uh, and the, the relationship of the 1992 Central Valley Improvement Act of, of 1992 to a variety of environmental laws, including some that I was just uh, summarizing. Uh, if that were not enough, he has served as an expert on property law in, in litigation, including a case to establish title to the baseball, uh, the Barry Bonds 73rd home run baseball, and who owned it. Right. He served as an expert witness and uh, also in an award-winning documentary film based on the case. Um, and I guess most relevant to this course, he's a, a key partner in interdisciplinary work with Professor Lund and Professor Moyle in the Public Policy Institute of California uh, on a variety of water-related uh, uh, issues. And he, he also serves on the Science Advisory Committee uh, to the Delta uh, Vision uh, Task Force, or he did. Uh, so he's, uh, he, he's a busy guy. And that, before I turn it over to Michael, I should mention that we have a special guest today, um, uh, one of my... Uh, heroes and mentors and role models, Phil Eisenberg, who in various capacities has served as the mayor of Sacramento, assembly, assemblyman from the Sacramento and Delta region. Uh, he and I worked most closely on the uh, aforementioned uh, uh, Delta Vision Task Force a few years ago, which much to my amazement and I believe to his, uh, about 90% of our recommendations actually were made their way into the landmark uh, Delta water reform legislation that the legislature enacted in 2009 and served as the first chair of the, uh, 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 and I'm getting my, my, my entities wrong. Delta Stewardship Council. Delta Stewardship Council. I should know this. I, we helped write the, write the legislation. <laughs> May a couple. It is so anyway, we're <laughs> delighted, Phil, that you're here and hope, uh, I, I'm sure he's very reticent, but maybe we can draw him out in the course <laughs> of the Q&A conversation. It would be a first. So uh, without further ado, Michael Lawford. Thanks. Do you need PowerPoint? Uh, please, thanks. Thank you very much, Rick, for that introduction, and I'm, I'm glad you're all out here today. I am going to do my best to avoid talking too much about the law because you would have gone to law school, or more of you would have gone to law school if you're interested in hearing that. But I'm going to use the legal backdrop for the clients that I represent, which are the 10 California Water Boards, to, to demonstrate how economics enter into the world of environmental decision making and environmental policy making. And we're very fortunate here in California that we have very robust environmental laws. 
And our water quality law in particular, what's known as the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act, is one of the strongest environmental measures for water quality protection in the country. It predates the Clean Water Act. I'm going to touch very briefly on the Federal Clean Water Act. But what's interesting to me about the Porter Cologne Act is while it is about water quality control and water quality protection, economics pervades it in many ways in, in the foundational findings and policy direction that the legislature sets out for the water, the water boards. But at the same time, there's incredible discretion left to these what are often disparagingly referred to as unelected decision makers, people who are very committed public servants trying to make decisions based on this broad framework that the legislature has laid out. The legislature talks about things like maximum benefit to the people and highest use, and that the water boards need to consider economics as they go about recognizing the highest values of our waters. But there's no cost benefit. There's no direction in terms of how the, the water boards, which are our principal water quality regulatory agencies, are to balance these competing interests. And that means that ultimately the decision makers who are in the role of making these incredibly important decisions that shape the quality of water in California, shape the level of effort that businesses and communities and private citizens will have to undertake in order to achieve these water quality goals, really have to step back and think holistically about the decisions they're going to make. And they need to be informed by their staff in terms of what are the types of things, what are the costs, what are the benefits, both tangible and intangible, of our decisions. So as I indicated, uh, the Port of Cologne Water Quality Control Act is our principal law in California for governing water quality protection. I'm going to describe that law briefly, and then I'm going to walk through a couple of sample examples as to how the water boards have made some incredibly difficult decisions. And then I'm, I'm going to kind of conclude my remarks by just sort of, of weighing what kind of holds the water boards back in exercising their discretion. Where they have a clear charge for water quality protection. They know that they need to look at a variety of, of economic concerns. But is that something that's in their comfort level? And you know, how does that actually play out when they're making a decision? So as I indicated, the, the Porter Cologne Act has as its legislative findings. And for those of you who are, are not as accustomed to the way the, our laws are written, Besides them dictating what we do, they often start off with a broad policy pronouncement, something from the legislature that will help both the citizens of the state, the administrative agencies who are charged with implementing those laws, as well as the courts in interpreting everything that follows, all of those directions. How are we going to you know, fine tune some of these ambiguous statements that end up in, in our laws? And the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act starts out with a fairly fairly specific, but also means everything to all people pronouncement of what law should be, of how the act should be construed. The legislature specifically found and declared that activities and factors which may affect the quality of the waters of the state shall be regulated to attain the highest quality which is reasonable, considering all demands being made and to be made on those waters, the total values involved, beneficial and detrimental, economic and social, tangible and intangible. Crystal clear, right? I mean, there is, you, you read that and you start off with the high sink. We are going to regulate, and that's what we do. That's why Rick has invited me here. The water boards are regulators. We control people's and businesses' conduct, and in particular with what we do, we control a lot of what cities and counties are supposed to do. And we're supposed to regulate them for water to be at the highest value. But then it goes on, which is reasonable. And reasonable means all things to all people. And on top of that, it's not just a matter of saying water quality, cost, but we got tangible and intangible. So right out of the bat, the water boards know that they've got to look at everything when they make their decisions. Interestingly, this is a contrast to the Federal Clean Water Act. The Federal Clean Water Act, which Rick referred to, um, actually followed California's Porter Cologne Act by about three years. And um, when you read the first legislative findings and policy directions from the Federal Act, there's very little in there that talks about these ideas of reasonable and value. Instead, the Federal Clean Water Act, which actually later on in its substantive implementing provisions has some fairly, fairly detailed uh, prescriptions on the implementing federal agencies as to how they balance some of these things. The Federal Clean Water Act just starts out with broad dictates. 
One of those dictates is that discharges to our, and that's you know, releases of effluent, water, waste, your sewage treatment plant, your refinery, discharges of pollutants to our nation's surface waters, our net, what are called navigable waters under the parlance of the act, shall be eliminated by 1985. I mean, that is an amazing thing when you stop and think about it. Anybody who gets into the environmental policy field, I mean, we all flush a toilet. It all goes and gets treated. And ultimately, though, no matter what level of treatment, it's going to go to a water, a surface water somewhere most likely, and it's still going to have pollutants in it. It is still a discharge of pollutants. There is no way that congressional policy statement, legislative goal, is ever going to be achieved in our lifetimes or any of our children's lifetimes. But that's how it starts. And there's no qualifying language on it. That's, what the, that's how Congress wanted that act interpreted. Likewise, it has another pronouncement. The discharge of toxic pollutants in toxic amounts shall be eliminated, period. And again, I mean, you know, science is an incredible thing. We can find all sorts of pollutants that are toxic to us and they're going to be present in pretty much every activity that humans are involved in. And yet, Congress says, we're going to stop that. And it doesn't happen. So the federal, it's an interesting contrast when you look at the economics from how those two acts start off. The, the state act, which broadly talks about all these different values that will need to be weighed. And then the federal act, which has these really strong mandates, but then goes on to cabin them in with a lot of economic uh, baggage, if you will, along the way. So in many respects, as I look at how those two laws come about being, uh, you know, I, I see that California made a fundamental difference in terms of how it would go about balancing all those issues. It recognized in the Porter Cologne Act that if we're going to have this, this, these value determinations made, I'm not sure we want a single person, a, an administrator or a director, making these decisions, somebody who serves at the pleasure of the governor and changes every four or eight years with term limits. And instead, in California, we ended up with a system of water boards. There are nine regional water boards. They are based on watershed boundaries. They are spread around the state. The people who serve on those boards have to be drawn within uh, their local region, within that watershed, in other words. And on top of that, they're lay people. Um, originally, under Porter Cologne and under its predecessor, there, there were specific qualifications that each member of the board had to have. It had to have a ba he or she had to have a background in agriculture, municipal wastewater, industrial. They had to be a, have a representative from a recognized uh, recreational water user. Um, there had to be a fish and wildlife representative. Now we've got seven members on each of the nine regional water boards, and they just have to have a diverse background. But the important thing is you have a, a mix of citizens, lay people. These are volunteer board members who are making these fundamental policy decisions between what's necessary to protect water quality and what kind of costs are we willing to bear in order to make those decisions. The other very interesting facet of the water boards that I think are, it's important for people to appreciate when the legislature is going to send out this broad authority to them is not only is it a multi-member, a plural body that is making these decisions, but their terms are staggered. And once they're confirmed, appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate, they are almost, barring graft, corruption, it never happens in California politics, uh, but they are essentially assured of being able to serve out their terms. And like I said, they're staggered. So what that means is, as administrations change and new governors come in, there's a durability not only on the board, on the board but that helps create and foster an expectation that the decisions it makes will be durable. So we have the nine regional boards, seven members on each board, they're lay boards. There's over, th this whole structure is overseen by a tenth water board. That's the board that I actually work for, the State Water Resources Control Board. And uh, that has five full-time members, again, diverse backgrounds. Those are specified by statute. But they are also implementing, the State Water Board, these board members, are implementing some of these same broad statutes. And so it's expected that they're going to have to balance these economic and, economic and environmental interests. And as we look at how these decisions are made, these board members are very sophisticated, especially these regional board members. They may not be sophisticated in terms of trade and background. They don't spend their lives in environmental law or environmental protection. But they are really committed. I mean, they read through rafts of binders to prepare for their monthly board meetings. They are educated um, by the constituents that they represent, but also by a professional staff. Throughout the water board family, in other words, all 10 water boards, we have 1,500 professional staff. I'll come back to that number later on when I talk about the number of economists we have. 
So when you look at how in California, under the Porter Cologne Act, we go about making decisions, I, I find it useful and instructive to think about a two-step process. We plan for our water quality, and then we permit or regulate to implement those plans. And that's an important distinction because it, it determines when the economics come into it uh, and how they come into the decision making. So on the planning level, California goes about and adopts what we call water quality control plans, basin plans. We identify what are the beneficial uses of our water. Do we use it for fish habitat, for endangered species? Do we use it for municipal water supply? All of the basins in the state are identified for the various uses that they have. And then we establish water quality objectives. These are essentially the levels of uh, pollutants that can be present in a water body and yet protect those beneficial uses. Overlying all of this, from that broad direction from the legislature, the state board has the charge to establish state policy for water quality control. This is another level of regulation. And in establishing that state policy, um, all of those basin plans have to follow what the state water board says. And there's an important economic environmental balance uh, determination that the state water board made long ago, back in 1968. And it said that for all of our waters, regardless of what their current uses are, regardless of whether or not we need to be especially protective of uh, endangered species needs or the fact that it's used as a source of municipal drinking water, regardless of those uses, we want to protect whatever high quality waters we have. And so we have a policy in the state of California called the non-degradation or anti-degradation policy, where whenever water is better than necessary to protect our beneficial uses, we are going to continue to protect it at that higher level. In other words, limit activities of humans that might pollute that water and avoid further degradation of that water unless it's necessary for the maximum benefit of the people of the state. Again, starting to inject an economic sense into that. If we're going to lower water quality beyond what's necessary to protect our uses of water, we're only going to do it if it's to the maximum benefit of the entire state, not just a select few. The second big step is the permitting step, permitting or regulatory step. And that is where the water boards make decisions to issue permits, issue cleanup orders, issue directives to businesses, municipalities, people that implement those plans, that protect those beneficial uses, that uh, implement and reduce pollutants in order to comply with the water quality objectives. Now, as I indicated, which of those steps you're in, and, and go on for hours about the finer points of each one, really determines when the economic considerations come into play and what flexibility and latitude the water boards have to consider economic interests. So I mentioned at the very start, that foundational level of Porter Cologne, the legislative policy, we want to regulate for the highest value and highest water quality, which is reasonable. And so when the water boards go about developing their plans, their water quality control plans or basin plans, that's the first thing they look at. What's going to be the highest level of water quality, which is reasonable? I mentioned in legislature, in, in laws, you start off with these broad policy pronouncements, but then you get into more detail as you go into the finer points of the law. How do the water boards have to implement their, their basin planning authority and their permitting authority? And you'd like to think, much like the Clean Water Act at the federal level, which starts to provide much more detail as you get into the weeds, that you'd see something similar when you get into the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act. And the reality is, there isn't much more there. When the water boards are establishing their water quality objectives, what they need to look for, once again, is the reasonable protection of those beneficial uses, a value judgment that's going to involve trading off you know, how much effort is necessary to protect, say, an endangered species. It's not going to be the snail darter in California. It might be something like the Delta smelt and the quality of water that it needs. And what is reasonable is going to change from time to time and place to place. As the boards go about making those determinations, the legislature has given them a little bit more detail. It says that in the water quality control plans, the water boards shall develop water quality objectives and identify beneficial uses that in their judgment, that's the language of the legislature, in their judgment will ensure the reasonable protection. And the re legislature recognized, every, you know, human activity is going to impact adversely water quality. And the legislature said it's not a ground stop, but you need to make sure you're not unreasonably perfect, protect, affecting beneficial uses, 
and that you have to consider a variety of factors, including but not limited to. In other words, the water boards are going to have to go through a list of items that I'm about to read off, but they have a broader charge to consider anything else that they think is relevant to determining whether or not it is uh, unreasonably affecting a beneficial use to allow certain pollutants. So they look at the past, present, and probable, another value determination, beneficial uses. Sometimes we recognize because of human development, you know, we may change why we are using particular water bodies. They may move more towards recreational. They may mo move towards agricultural supply. The boards need to look in that future and make a, a determined, a reasoned determination as to what's probable. They need to consider the conditions that can reasonably be achieved within a water body. And again, a value and economic determination as to what is likely to change. I mean, we know we can't take everything back to pure water state. What's, what can reasonably be achieved? Most important for purposes of the conversation today, economic considerations. But economic considerations isn't described. We already know that the board should look at tangible and intangible. Um, economic considerations can mean everything from what's it going to cost society to comply with this requirement? What about what is the benefit, the economic benefit to society of having cleaner water? It's a conversation the, the water boards historically haven't really been willing to engage in, but economic considerations is as broad as that. How about uh, in order to implement these requirements, you're going to create new jobs because you're going to require new technologies to be developed and deployed out into the field that in, engage high-skilled workers. All of this gets wrapped into the mix. And one other factor worth noting is that the boards need to consider or housing needs within the region. There are a couple others. They don't really touch on these economic considerations, but that's what gets thrown into the mix when they develop these plans. And that is, a, that is a large pot to draw from. It's not the exclusive pot. The legislature said you can go including but not limited to. And so in all of those, the water boards need to go through their machinations and figure out ultimately what's in the best interest of the people of the state in these requirements. Now there is some overlay from the Federal Clean Water Act when we're adopting these water quality control plans, but none of it affects the economics. I mean, the, board, the water boards essentially have to rely on Porter Cologne's, Porter Cologne when they're doing their economic considerations. And as I indicated, those economic considerations are agnostic determinations. They're not about cost of compliance exclusively. They're about what kind of economic benefits we get, what kind of economic detriment we have from implementing it. And it also provides the flexibility to look to new and novel areas, like what kind of jobs might we create through these requirements. All this kind of wraps up with a, a, a final point that I want to make about basin planning, and it's something that administrative agency attorneys like me immediately grasp, but um, may not necessarily be intuitive to other folks. When the boards are exercising this policy, these policy determinations, the legislature has said, basically, you almost have a clean slate, water boards, with the powers that we're giving you. It's in your judgment what's going to be reasonable in a particular context. And that is, what that means is the courts, when they look at the decisions and when others challenge the decisions of the boards, the courts are going to be very deferential to how the water board mixes all these different policy issues and ultimately comes out with a directive. So that's the first step, the, sort of the planning policy step. The second step is the permitting step. And the interesting thing is under this is an area where the California Port of Cologne Act is a little bit different than the Clean Water Act because in the Federal Clean Water Act, once you get to the permitting stage, it's pretty much all about implementing the plans that you've adopted, what are known as water quality standards under the Federal Act, and then to a lesser extent implementing uh, what are known as technology forcing, technology-based effluent limitations that US EPA dictates need to apply nationwide. In California, when, we're go when the water boards are going about adopting regulatory requirements, a permit to uh, a particular discharger, they have to first look at those policies and make sure they're implementing them. But there is an opportunity, if it's an, a permit issued solely under the Porter Cologne Act, to do a reality check and go back and reconsider each one of those economic factors, or one of those factors I just described, economic considerations, the pre past, present, and probable future beneficial uses, and the need for housing. So how does this kind of play out when the water boards make a decision? I'm going to choose one recent example. Um, it's actually a local example. Um, in fact, I know at least probably two people in this room who rely on Sacramento Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant for their, uh, their services for discharging of their toilet flushes. 
And uh, in particular, what I want to walk through is one of the economic issues associated with recent requirements that were put on the, the city of Sacramento's wastewater treatment plant. And this is a plant that serves most, most of metropolitan Sacramento. It is uh, the largest inland discharger of wastewater in California, or it, I should say in the Central Valley. I mean, you have some, some of the Los Angeles treatment plants are pretty large, but the Sacramento Regional Treatment Plant um, can handle about 181 million gallons per day of wastewater. And it's actually one of the older plants from a perspective of the technology that it implements, um, what it uses to treat. It does not have the more sophisticated treatment systems that we rely on elsewhere in the state. And one of the issues that came up recently, its permit was long overdue and the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board had been in the process of reissuing the permit for nearly 10 years. One of the, the big concerns is, uh, with anyone familiar with their geography, and I didn't get to hear the presentation last week, but of course, the Sacramento River is tributary to the Bay Delta estuary, um, home to a couple handfuls of endangered species that are either resident or migratory through the Bay Delta. Um, it is the hub of California's water system, and a portion, uh, or 25 million Californians rely on a portion of their drinking water coming from the Delta. And yet the Sacramento treatment plant lies just uh, a few dozen miles upstream from the Delta estuary. It's actually technically part of the legal Delta by, by definition. And here was a treatment plant, huge treatment plant, that had not been upgraded to deal with ammonia discharges. Ammonia, you, some of you all may be familiar with, is both a nutrient, but it's also toxic to a lot, of, or a lot of aquatic life, especially once you get it in high enough numbers. Luckily, the Sacramento River, big river, flowing right over the outfall for Sacramento Regional Wastewater Plant, and it, it dilutes most of that acute effect. But there's a huge scientific debate about what goes on further down in the delta with these tens of thousands of pounds of nitrogen that, is being, that was being discharged into the Sacramento River. And the science on this was really uncertain. But there were real costs associated with upgrading that sewage treatment plant. In fact, as the, the, the matter was being considered by the regional board, the, the, city of Sac or the Sacramento Regional Wastewater Facility um, came up with studies showing it was going to be $782 million just to deal with the nitrogen and ammonia effects of that treatment plant, and to upgrade that plant to deal with what's known as nitrification, denitrification. The water boards looked at that issue and did their own studies and came up with a number that was about $200 million less. And so the question became, given all the debate over the Bay Delta estuary and nitrogen in the Bay Delta estuary, is a $782 million investment appropriate? And so how did the water boards go about resolving this issue? Multiple days of hearings over the course of years before the regional water board, lots of new scientific uh, literature, some of it peer reviewed, some of it not. And all of this was presented to the lay board members who had to ultimately make a policy call. And what were some of the things that they looked at? You know, they, they looked at the determinations from their staff. They looked at some of the costs. They looked around the state and saw most of the other facilities had already upgraded to deal with nitrification or, uh, or nitrogen removal. They also looked at, well, okay, Sacramento, what are they paying for the rates in the city of Sacramento? What does Rick Frank, a rate payer, I believe, for that district pay? Well, it turns out their rates were about a third of the rates of the statewide average. And even if you were to accept the district's numbers, the, that would probably only drive their rates up to approximating the average uh, around the state. All this came together in a fairly vociferous clash. And ultimately, the water board, the regional board in the first instance, and the state board in the second instance upholding what the regional board did, looked at the uncertainty. And in particular, looked at the fact that we have the delta, you know, such a vital resource for the state of California vital to endangered species passing through it. And a lot of uncertainty about whether or not there wasn't any single magic bullet to fix the Delta, but a lot of concern that with this ongoing discharge and this ongoing loading of nitrogen to the Delta system, that all the other efforts the state was putting into it would be for naught because this could be a tipping point where just continuing to allow that nitrogen coming down into the system could ensure that the system would, would, never be, would never recover. And so the water board kind of evaluated all this, mixed up all the information and said, you know, it's not worth the risk. We're going to go ahead and understand our charge, exercise our, our authority and regulate to the highest quality that we can 
And you know, we'll continue looking at this issue of economic uncertainty, but it, or of scientific uncertainty, but ultimately, we're gonna expect the ratepayers of Sacramento to go ahead and pay for this. Now the interesting thing is, as that particular matter went forward, um, you have an, an environment that is very adversarial before the water boards. You have public water agencies serving uh, state water project contractors. These are people who benefit from state water project water and are down um, starting in South Bay, Santa Clara, all the way down to south of the Hatchpies in Los Angeles. They're very concerned that all the investments they're making to upgrade the plumbing will be for naught if these discharges continue coming from SAC Regional. So they're heavily involved. Very strong, very, uh, I will say strong-willed people. I'm sure uh, Tim Quinn put on a good perspective last week. But very strong-willed people, very lawyered up, and very willing to throw as much as they can in terms of both the law and the science to their view. Environmental groups who are very strong in protecting the environment were heavily engaged. And then SAC Regional, working very hard to protect its ratepayers. And you know what happens when you get this clash on economic and scientific issues is often the truth lies somewhere in the middle of all of this. And it's not always the best decision-making framework. And what, the reason I say that this is a good example of that is we have numbers coming from SAC Regional during the proceeding talking about $782 million to do the upgrade. The regional board trying to come up with numbers was coming up with something in the more like $400 million range. Once all the dust settled and people actually, instead of, of working on entrenched positions and protecting their economic interests, or, and you could say both the state water contractors were protecting their economic interests, but also SAC Regional was protecting their economic interests and the interests of their ratepayers, once the dust settled and people rolled up their sleeves, sharpened their pencils, and looked at it, Sacramento Regional actually came up with an alternative way of treating their nitrogen a system that's ultimately going to end up costing their ratepayers more like $300 million, less than what the regional board had calculated and half the cost of what Sacramento Regional had projected to the public before the event. I'm just going to kind of pull this back up because I want to get it over to Professor Gray so he can provide some counterpoints and some thoughts, but express one of the things that I see as an attorney to the regulators as they make these decisions. They have this broad charge. But I have, I, my client agencies have about 1,500 employees. Mostly it's engineers and scientists. There is one economist in the entire 1,500 mix. Now I will say we used to have about eight to nine economists that would be able to support the activities of the board, but budget cuts, those were some of the first to retire and go. And what that means is you have a lot of people making decisions who are really making decisions with enormous economic considerations and enormous economic impacts but talking about economics and talking about what is the value of the fish, what is the value of an ecosystem, what is it going to cost to actually build this plant, all of that is stuff that is outside of their wheelhouse. They are not always comfortable in that conversation, and so often they shy away from it. And I, I have to say, um, from my perspective, that's a bad thing. Because one of the things that, uh, that suffuses the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act is this balancing of economic and environmental interests. And it's not a monolithic, we protect the environment at all costs. We have to make difficult decisions. And you can't make those decisions unless you really step back and think and are willing to engage on all the different factors. Uh, because it may be more difficult to put the value on an ecosystem, that doesn't mean it's not worth having the conversation. And Porter Cologne expects that the water boards will have this conversation. And I will say, I talked about these being plural bodies and they, their decisions being enduring and they need to be willing to work together to make enduring and difficult decisions. And um, one of the things that I think has been really important over the last several years is that we have had a board that, and this is now at the state board level, so the umbrella board that oversees the nine regional boards, that's willing to engage and talk about some of these issues of economic costs and you know, what are the values we're trying to protect. And in doing so, they've, they've launched initiatives. They're, they're not going to change what the law says. We're still going to be responsible for regulating to water to the highest uh, value and quality. But they're trying to build up a set of tools so that when we do this, we can do what it's, gonna, it's known as the cost of compliance effort, where in all of the decision making that the water boards do, they will try to articulate what are the costs involved? What, what do we think? What are the economic benefits that we intend to get? And it's not going to compromise the protections that the boards are responsible for making, but it's going to give their staff the tools to engage in this conversation 
And so ultimately, the decisions that they make not only you know, reflect the intent of the law, but can be more valuable and enduring to the people that the water boards serve. There is no magic answer. In fact, as I was preparing my comments, I was talking to a, an unnamed, very high-level uh, regulator. He may be a director of a state agency that protects water quality. And I said, well, you know, it's interesting because Rick and Peter and Jay have this class on reconciling ecosystem in the environment or ecosystems in the economy. And, well, his response was, well, that's an easy one. The ecosystem always loses. And, you know, that's a really depressing thought for somebody who's a, a regulator. And there's, a, unfortunately, a lot of areas around the state and around the country where that has been true. But there have also been a lot of successes. And California is leading the way in restoring some ecosystems that would have been decades ago just written off. Mono Lake, something we haven't talked about today and might be a good opportunity for further conversation as we move forward, is a case of an ecosystem being restored with economic costs. But economic costs that the State Water Board went into eyes wide open after being kicked in the tail repeatedly in the courts to look at some of these issues, but went in eyes wide open to make difficult decisions to restore that ecosystem. And yet the City of Los Angeles and Los Angeles Department of Water and Power that relies on it as a, or relies on its tributaries as a source of water hasn't suffered. And in fact, it's required them to innovate and do more creative things than we're doing in lots of other places in California. So with that. Five minutes. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Professor Gray. Hopefully, we'll have a few minutes for a question and answer period. We see we have a few people lined up against the wall. We have plenty of seats here in the front rows. If you would like to sit down. Well, I'll try and be uh, relatively brief because I think it would. I think it's very important for us to have a conversation and to. Uh, uh, answer questions that you might have. And I would love for, since Phil Eisenberg is here, I would, think, I would love to get him up here uh, to participate in that as well. So uh, let me get right to it. Um, I want to say I, I agree with Michael's statement that that this managing our water system is really all about choices. I mean, there's nothing magical. There are very few overriding laws that trump everything else. There are a couple, but for the most part, these are value judgments that we have to make as a society. We make them through our legislature. We make them sometimes through our courts. We make them principally through uh, public demand choices, and we make them through regulatory agencies, including the Delta Stewardship Council or planning and regulatory agencies and the State Water Resources Control Board. But I agree with Michael, we're not very good at identifying the key factors, the economic factors, the environmental factors. We're very good at litigating and arguing over those, uh, but I think we haven't developed a way to really uh, address those issues in, in a reasoned and constructive way. The other thing I just want to say is, you know, I think that the environment ecosystems do tend to lose out, although the laws, as I'm about to describe, the water rights laws are really very heavily oriented toward protection of public rights and especially protection of uh, ecosystems and environmental rights. But there are notable success stories, and, and I think we, we certainly should not lose sight of those as well. Mono Lake is an example. The restoration of the San Joaquin River, which now may be in political jeopardy, uh, is another example of that. Uh, the protection of endangered species generally, I think, is, is really a great success story, despite the fact that we still have many species listed for protection under the statute. So I want to talk just a little bit about our water rights system. We have a very complicated system of water rights in California. We have riparian rights, which originated under the common law of England. They arise out of the ownership of real property that is adjacent to or along a river or a stream. They are regarded as being fundamental parts of the ownership of property. We also have appropriative water rights, which was the, the rules and the law that the gold miners ultimately created to resolve disputes among themselves, first as to the uh, ownership and location on land, and then disputes over water. And it's the, the, the appropriative rights system is now the dominant water rights system in California. It's the system that allows water to be taken great distances from where it's located in the Sierra Nevada and the Coast Range and move to the Bay Area, the San Joaquin Valley, and Southern California. Uh, we've got prescriptive rights. We have Pueblo water rights, which are uh, or originated in Spanish and Mexican law, which are very important parts of Los Angeles's water rights system. Los Angeles has supreme rights to uh, all of the 
uh, waters of the Los Angeles River, which isn't much, but also all hydrologically connected groundwater. So it's a very significant type of right. There are federal reserved water rights that the federal government owns as a result of its ownership and stewardship of certain lands, such as national parks and national forests. So it's a very complicated system. But the most important thing about the water rights system is, again, it is a property rights system. It creates property rights that, as Rick said, are protected under the 5th and 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Governments may not take water rights just as they may not take private property. Now, what is a taking of property is also very complicated, and the Supreme Court has, a, has kind of a vague, malleable jurisprudence that we have to apply to determine what is a taking. But it's important to remember that these are property rights. They are property rights. They are, were designed to encourage investment. They are designed to recognize, again, aspects of real property ownership. Uh, they are designed to protect reliance interests, those who have invested. But the water right is a, is a, is a unique form of property right. It's a very fragile and dynamic and malleable form of property right. It's infused with a public interest. It is limited by constitutional law and common law that requires that the owners of water rights, those who benefit from water, exercise their rights in a way that comports with a public interest, uh, is reasonable under certain circumstances, does not unduly degrade the environment, fish, ecosystems that may be affected by the use of water. The most important law that does that is the reasonable use doctrine, which was placed into California's constitution in 1928 by an act of the voters. But the reasonable use doctrine was part of the riparian system, and it was part of the appropriative system long before the constitution was amended in 1928. And that's important, again, as when we talk about environmental regulation. What it basically says, the constitution says, is that all water must be used and all water rights must be exercised in a way that is reasonable under the circumstances and water must be applied to some beneficial use and again those requirements then again inject into this private property right very important aspects of the public interest. Now, what is a reasonable use? It's as difficult to say categorically what a reasonable use of water is in a water rights context as it is in a water quality context. The board is directed to set water quality standards that are reasonable under the circumstances, taking into account just about every conceivable factor that you can think of. And to some extent, those, that same amorphous character applies in the water rights system. The California Supreme Court, in a tiny case involving Nicasio Creek and Marin County um, said the following, and this is language that gets repeated in much bigger reasonable use cases uh, ever since 1967. But the California Supreme Court said, this is in the Jocelyn case, that although as we have said what is a reasonable use of water depends on the circumstances of each case, such an inquiry cannot be resolved in vacuo, isolated from statewide considerations of transcendent importance. Paramount among these, we see the ever-increasing need for the conservation of water in this state, an, an inescapable reality of life quite apart from its express recognition in the Constitution. Well, what are these transcendent uh, conditions of statewide con considerations of transcendent importance? Again, we don't really know, but these are decisions that have to get made on a case-by-case -case basis situationally as influenced by a broad array of other laws, but also as influenced by contemporary real world on the ground in the water considerations. And it will vary depending on whether we are in a situation where water is relatively abundant or if we are in a situation of drought such as today. So questions that the board has to confront, that the Delta Stewardship Council confronts, that uh, courts have to confront, that the legislature confronts again, is it reasonable uh, today to irrigate water by transporting water through unlined ditches, a, a long-standing practice. Is it reasonable uh, to a flood irrigate or furrow irrigate instead of sprinkler irrigating or drip irrigating? Is it, re is it unreasonable to grow certain types of crops that may require large amounts of water compared to other crops? Is it reasonable for people to hose down their driveways in, in times of drought, fill swimming pools, have outdoor landscaping, use water to irrigate lawns? Well, these are all, again, value choices and 
The, the board has a role in making those determinations. State water, excuse me, st state and local water managers also have an important role to play in making those determinations as to what is a reasonable use. But this is a very powerful doctrine because it not only says that water has to be used reasonably under current situation, but the definition of what is reasonable may change over time. The Supreme Court is, of California has been very candid and explicit in making the point that a practice of water use that may have been reasonable back in the day may no longer be reasonable because of change circumstances. And those may be change circum hydrologic circumstances, it may be technological developments, it may be demographic and economic change, it may be changes in public values as well. And that's very important because, again, water rights are property rights, but the property right in water is limited by the reasonable use doctrine. And that means that if board, if a court determines that a use of water today for whatever reason, it has to be a good reason, but for whatever reason is, un, is an unreasonable use, well that means according to the California Supreme Court that the property right in water no longer exists. It no longer extends to what is determined, determined today at, to be a, an unreasonable use of water. So it's a very powerful doctrine because it vests in the board and other agencies authority to investigate current uses of water in light of their effects on the environment, in light of their effects on other water users, in light of long-term planning goals for the state. But it also then allows them to regulate and make changes in current uses of water in order to fulfill the reasonable use mandate without violating the property rights. Because again, this is a very fragile form of property rights, a very unusual form of property right. Another fundamental aspect of the water rights system is the public trust doctrine. The public trust doctrine originated in Roman law. It was part of the English common law. It was incorporated into American common law. All of the coastal states recognized the public trust doctrine in their shorelines and beaches. A number of inland states recognized the public trust doctrine with respect to their inland waters and the submerged lands beneath those waters as well. California and Hawaii, California was the first to do it, have incorporated the public trust doctrine into their water rights system. And again, the California Supreme Court has held that all water rights, all uses of water are limited by the public trust doctrine and current uses of water must comport with the public trust. Now again, the court has said that, that the public trust and the reliance interest in water, the economic use of water must be accommodated under current circumstances, but the public trust serves to limit uh, the use of water in particular circumstances. The California Supreme Court uh, in a, again, a case out of Marin County, a very small, obscure case in 1971, uh, changed the public trust doctrine. It was a doctrine that originally protected navigation, commerce, and fishing, and the California Supreme Court just in one fell swoop held that the doctrine is also an ecological doctrine. It protects the environment, it protects ecological uses. Um, and it was on that basis, that served as the basis for the California Supreme Court's Mono Lake decision in the National Audubon Society case. And it was in that case that the court incorporated the public trust doctrine into the water rights system and vested in the board as well as in courts the responsibility for determining that the current water use doesn't unduly degrade the public trust, doesn't unduly diminish public trust interests in, in fishing, in navigability, but also in the ecological preservation of a resource, in that case, the Mono Lake case. Rick mentioned that I uh, was asked to be a member of the uh, Science Advisory Board for the uh, Delta Vision Task Force. Um, and as I understand it, the reason I was asked to join is because they wanted someone who knew the law and they were particularly interested in the public trust doctrine. And I remember meeting with the group of scientists and describing what the public trust doctrine did. And they were, I think, just amazed that the law in that context uh, fit very nicely into scientific analysis. The public trust doctrine again says that, that, that a use of water that may once have been fine uh, may no longer be valid because of its effects on the natural environment, because of harm to an ecosystem. And we may make that determination based upon changes in scientific understanding. We may make it also because of changes in hydrology, changes in water use, changes in the needs of an ecosystem, listing of species, factors such as that. And I remember that the, the scientists involved were very impressed that there was actually an aspect of law, which I think they thought of as being uh, quite a rigid concept, uh, 
that worked in a way that, again, recognized that conditions change and our understanding of those conditions change and that the underlying rights to use the resource then must evolve to be consistent with those changes and consistent with our new scientific understanding. So those are two very important limitations on water rights. But as I said, as I said at the outset, basically whether a use is reasonable, to some extent whether a use can be accommodated with the public trust or might take precedence over the public trust in any individual circumstance is a judgment that has to be made based upon scientific considerations, to some extent economic considerations, to some extent technological considerations, to some extent uh, policy judgments. There, there are very few things in the law that again function as as a trump card that, o that are overriding considerations. So, so in the water rights system, just as in the water quality setting, we constantly have to make these choices based upon as good of information as we can develop in a particular setting, whether it's a regulatory setting, whether it's in a managerial setting, uh, or in a, in a litigation context. There are, there are some aspects of the law that give clarity to this. Uh, the Delta Reform Act, which created the Delta Stewardship Council in 2009, uh, said that um, th for the Delta, that there shall be co-equal goals of reliable water supply and a sustainable ecosystem. Uh, and again, that kind of elevated then the idea of sustainability. It elevates the public trust or places the public trust in a co-equal status uh, with the consumptive uses and developmental uses of the ecosystem. But again, how we determine what is co-equal in a changing setting is a very complex task. And again, I'm hoping that Phil might be, speak a little bit to that in just a few minutes. The, the one aspect of our law that does have overriding directives to protect the environment is the Federal Endangered Species Act and to some extent the State Endangered Species Act as well. I'll just for simplicity stick to the Federal Act. The Federal Act uh, requires that uh, any federal agency, and in California that includes the Central Valley Project operated by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, but also the State Water Project operated by the California Department of Water Resources because they operate in a coordinated way pursuant to contract as well as statutory law. Um, the Endangered Species Act says that, that uh, all federal agencies must ensure that their actions do not jeopardize the continued existence of any endangered or threatened species uh, or, um, or uh, significantly uh, impair their uh, critical habitat. Um, there are some accommodations made for economic uses and developmental uses. There may be incidental take of certain listed species. A certain number of species may be killed in the operation, say, of the water projects. Habitat may be altered to some extent, but the overarching directive is that the species must be protected and their critical habitat must be preserved. And there's a separate pr provision of the statute that prohibits the taking the harming, the, 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 the capture, the harming, the wounding, or the killing of protected species. Um, and again, it provides civil and criminal penalties. And so when you put these two provisions of the statute together, uh, they create what the U.S. Supreme Court has called very powerful uh, directives and incentives to operate federal projects, or in the case of California's water system, the coordinated operation of the federal and state projects in a way that protects the species. And this is particularly important as we move into the drought because the other laws allow for, again, an accommodation of interest. They require an accommodation of interest. They require ultimately an analysis of what is reasonable. What is a reasonable choice to make between water supply and environmental protection? Protection of reliance interests, contract rights, property rights, and environmental considerations. This statute, again, says that the species must be protected, period. And what that means in the, in, as we move into a drought or as we move further into drought is that those provisions will be in place and they will require that the state and federal projects be operated in a way, despite economic difficulties that, met, that, 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 that may cause, that they be operated in a way that does the best in terms of, as best as the regulators can determine, to protect the endangered and threatened species that inhabit or pass through uh, the, delta, the delta ecosystem. And that will provide a baseline of protection uh, that is really, again, unique, unique in the law. Now, again, there's nothing magic about that. That is the enactment of the Endangered Species Act, which authorized the uh, listing of 
of all runs of salmon and steelhead, a variety of other uh, species that inhabit the delta, pelagic species that inhabit, inhabit the delta, such as the delta smelt. Um, that was a political choice that Congress made back in 1973. That's a political choice that Congress can undo. Um, I would expect that there will be bills introduced in Congress to suspend Endangered Species Act protections to allow greater uh, water supply. There is a bill that uh, is pending before the full House of Representatives now, H.R. Uh, 3964, uh, that would suspend uh, provisions of the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, um, which uh, requires that about 20% of the yield of the Central Valley Project be dedicated to fish and wildlife purposes. This bill would uh, suspend that during the drought. It also uh, would suspend the, uh, the uh, restoration of the San Joaquin River, releases of water from Fryant Dam uh, on the San Joaquin River in order to uh, allow for the, uh, repropag excuse me, the propagation of, uh, of salmon in the river. And so again, I don't think that's going to pass the Senate. It would be likely that the President would veto it. You never know. Bills like this can get packaged into an omnibus piece of legislation that has to be passed for overriding considerations, but I think it's unlikely to pass. But it, it shows again that these types of decisions, you know, water supply versus fish, uh, water to cities uh, and farms as opposed to water left in place for the needs of the ecosystem, these are fundamentally political choices. There's nothing, there's no constitutional law that, that overrides these choices. Uh, these are, and to the extent there is constitutional law, again, it requires for a reasonable use determination. So these are fundamentally policy choices uh, that, we, that we have to make. The other thing that I, I think we are likely to see uh, as uh, water contractors in the CVP and the State Water Project receive very little water this year. Farmers have been uh, promised a 0% allocation of water in the State Water Project uh, and, and in most areas of the Central Valley Project, uh, a 0 or maybe 5% uh, water supply this year. Um, we're likely to see uh, litigation filed, and that litigation will be under the Fifth Amendment for a taking of property. It will also be litigation for breach of water contracts uh, by which the federal and state governments have pledged a reliable water supply to the contractors. So far, that litigation, with a couple of exceptions, so far that litigation has been resolved in favor of the United States and in favor of the overriding regulatory interests. But I think we are likely to see um, uh, litigation being filed again, challenging the endangered species requirements that water be allocated to the fish uh, in, in, uh, in, in this situation of, of a drought. So let, let me stop there. And again, I hope we have some time for, for questions. We're almost out of time. We've got a couple minutes for questions. So um, I would ask the speakers uh, to whomever the questions uh, addressed were taking this. So I'll try and paraphrase the question. So questions for Professor Gray, Michael, or me, or comments? Or put you all to sleep. Professor? In some of the previous talks, uh, Moyle and uh, we were talking about Blue Creek, and, and fairly putting it forward as a successful example of reconciliation, which was, I guess, instigated by lawsuits and resolved in the courts, partial litigation. On a larger scale, what institution or individual has the legal authority to? Uh, to determine a reasonable reconciliation that, that's involving maybe more than just water rights or endangered species and has a, a, a regional scale, it might have a whole bunch of different water quality and water right aspects to it, and endangered species. And it, is it the courts? Does it just have to be something that just have to be you know, fought in a very incremental, long-term, ugly way through the courts? Is it something the regional water boards can sort of come in and sort of mediate a process that leads it through, is it the Department of Fish and Wildlife, or maybe in, in the case of the Delta, maybe the Delta Stewardship Council is an appropriate kind of organ to, to shepherd this kind of process through. But otherwise, it, it seems like it will be just really ugly on a, on a large scale outside of the few reaches of Puerto Creek to, to, uh, to see this kind of thing through. Why don't we uh, turn to Michael first? Who, who, who resolves the big, ugly water disputes? Who is well, <laughs> You know, with Puda Creek, and uh, I've heard Peter talk about it before, but you know, my perspective is that it's going to take, the courts aren't well positioned to, to resolve these. And some of the most successful resolutions in California have been really negotiated resolutions. But the important thing has been either the courts 
telling the water boards to get everybody together. And then it's a matter of once you've got that, that stick hanging out there, whether it's the regulatory agency that's going to inflict a lot of pain on somebody, that's when you start to pull together and, you know, for example, uh, it may be a particular entity that the boards have either a water quality hook into or a water rights hook into. And if the pain is significant enough for them, they're going to start to pull in others and ultimately you're going to get a solution that's a negotiated solution. If it's not, it's going to be something that the water boards, they're in the position because the state water board at least touches both components, uh, the water rights and the water quality side, that we can drive some of these solutions. But even for us, we don't reach every aspect of it. I mean, off, you know, right now, and I don't know how much you all had the conversation about the BDCP, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, which is something that uh, the administration and the federal government have embraced. It's outside of the water boards, but it's an effort to kind of put everything together in one place, tie together Endangered Species Act permits with changes in water rights so that you can have long-term operations. But it's ultimately a negotiated solution. It's not an adversarial regulated solution. But I think you need to have either the courts or a regulator willing to come in and you know, knock heads around for a little bit so that people really have an incentive to talk and find those long-term solutions. I would, uh, I would answer the question slightly differently. I agree with most of what's been said. But one of the quirky things about California, when it comes to what consumptive water rights of the type Professor Gray was talking about, the courts and the state water ha board have what is called concurrent jurisdiction. So someone from the business community, the environmental community, who's unhappy about some water issue, water dispute, or water allocation, has the option of either going to court in the first instance or filing a, a petition before the state water board. That's to be contrasted with water quality, water pollution decisions, where really the water board is where you've got to go in the first instance, and it's going to make those hard decisions, like with respect to the, uh, the sanitary uh, district in, in, uh, in Sacramento. So uh, I would argue that the, the water boards have a, a larger and more authoritative role to deal with these big, ugly, nasty issues with respect to water pollution, uh, a shared responsibility with respect to water rights, and then left out in all that, and those of you who are hydrologists know, water quality, as, as no less a person than Justice, uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said about 20 years ago in a Supreme Court decision, water quality and water rights are two sides of the same coin. It's, it's hard to distinguish those, but in our legal system, treats those as, as distinct principles. I, I couldn't agree more with Rick. That's an important point. The courts have concurrent jurisdiction. And I'm going to look to Professor Gray because he actually does the academic research and may, may know the answer to this. But the last time that I checked, when you look at, at how the courts resolve these with, through an adjudication process, um, there wasn't an adjudication in California that actually the court had to come impose it. Instead, in every instance, at least in the groundwater basins, every single one of them has essentially been negotiated because they were all afraid of what the courts would do. And so, you know, that's why I say you need to have that powerful tool, whether it's a court or a cold-hearted regulator coming in and threatening to bang heads, because that gets people talking like nobody's business. Yeah, and if I could just say, I, yeah, I, I think that the most constructive role that courts can play is as this kind of looming threat. Uh, and, and I think the, there, there are times when agencies, uh, water agencies or parties on the other side are intransigent and they kind of need need to have a two by four taken to them, if you will. But I think, again, the, the, the judges, you know, judges will have said to me, and, and they'll say in any context, they're just not well suited to make these types of, de of decisions. And so I think what, what they can do is they can take the threat of an Endangered Species Act judgment or an or unreasonable use determination or a, or a decision that the public trust is being violated and then induce the parties to sit down, really encourage them to sit down and negotiate a, a solution. Now, sometimes, again, the regula regulatory agencies will have to get involved as well. But we see a number of examples of that. We see the groundwater adjudications. It's absolutely right. They, they, they have all been based upon settlements that, again, were derived from the threat of a judicial decree, transfers of water from uh, Imperial Irrigation District to the Metropolitan Water District were uh, induced by an unreasonable use determination. The Mono Lake uh, ultimate resolution was a state water board decision which ultimately resulted in a settlement. And again, that was uh, really, I think, prompted by the uh, public trusts and, and some statutory violations in involving the Fish and Game Code that, uh, that uh, the courts found Los Angeles to be in violation of. So again, I think that there's this synergistic role and the courts can play a very constructive but really secondary or tertiary role. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time.
So uh, we'll see you next week. In the meantime, please join me in thanking Michael Offer. And